So I'm Stan Holmes, um, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator with Utah Citizens Advocating Renewable Energy, uh, or UCARE. And we formed in uh, 2014. Um, David Bennett uh, is uh, also a member of UCARE, and is going to be speaking in a little bit, followed by uh, Scott Jones from Creative Energies. And so well, I think what we're going to do is maybe cut it short a little bit, but you have um, the Utah Clean Energy video. I do. Okay, so before the video uh, comes in, and Utah Clean Energy has been one of our key allies um, in efforts to, uh, uh, to stave off efforts, in efforts to stave off the, uh, the power company's uh, surcharges and uh, uh, rate increases. We formed in 2014 when there was a proposed a, a surcharge by Rocky Mountain Power and rooftop solar customers, residential customers. Um, and we uh, actually got a good ruling from the Public Service Commission uh, in 2014 that set up a framework for looking at the costs and benefits of solar, rooftop solar. That uh, um, reached another milestone in 2015 when the, uh, uh, the, the Public Service Commission called on the power company to do a cost-benefit uh, analysis. And that came out, um, was finished and filed uh, the day after um, the uh, November election. So in any case, they, they, they filed a compliance uh, of, uh, report and they also um, uh, proposed a three-part rate structure, which would have put a demand charge for the first time uh, on uh, rooftop solar customers. It would have also increased the customer charge, it would have been, uh, reduced the amount that you get compensated for energy that you put into the grid. Um, and that didn't set very well. So um, a, a variety of groups, including industry representatives from, from Vivint and ARC and others, um, I met with the governor. Uh, the governor was apprised of the fact that what we would have happen here would be similar to what happened in Nevada, where the rug was yanked out, yanked out from underneath the, uh, the solar industry, and a lot of those jobs were lost and fled to Utah. But we didn't want to keep those jobs moving on, we wanted to keep them here. So uh, what ensued then was um, uh, a set of negotiations with the power company, with the Office of Consumer Services, with various advocate, advocacy groups that went on until August. Um, but I think what we'll do right now is take a look at the agreement that was, uh, the, the settlement that was reached and proposed to the Public Service Commission on September 18th, and which is now being considered by the Public Service Commission. There's a good chance it's gonna be adopted but there are some changes, as Jason pointed out, that are uh, that are going to be happening very quickly. So let's uh, maybe turn now. Maybe if we can. Sure. How did Aaron dim those lights? How did you I can do, do that? that. <laughs> so that's going to change the way things work for solar here in Utah. But it's complicated, so we wanted to give you an overview of what it means, and especially what it means for current and future solar customers. Let's start with how things work right now. If you have solar on your home currently, then when you're home, the energy that you produce on your roof goes to power your home. But if you're not home, it gets sent out to the utility grid. And that energy is measured in kilowatt hours. So every kilowatt hour you send to the grid gets you one kilowatt hour credit in exchange. And that kilowatt hour credit is applied towards your bill to cancel out energy that you would purchase from the utility otherwise. So that's how things work right now, and that's called net metering. If you have solar already, no matter when you install, you'll be grandfathered into the current net metering program until 2036, that's 19 years and your bills will look exactly the same. No new fees and no new charges. Just a kilowatt hour per kilowatt hour trade. If you don't already have solar, you still have a few weeks to get that same deal and be grandfathered in. A key step to installing solar is filing what's called an interconnection application. And keep that in mind. You have a couple more weeks, either until 60 days after the Public Service Commission issues a final ruling on the settlement, or November 15th, whichever happens first, to get that interconnection application in, and you'll be considered part of the current net metering program and grandfathered until 2036. So if you've been thinking about installing solar, now is the time to contact the solar installer and get things started and get your interconnection application filed, because installing in the next few weeks is the best deal that you're gonna get. If you're not ready to install solar right now, that's okay. You'll still have the option to go solar through what's called the transition program. You might not save quite as much money on your utility bills, but it's still a pretty good deal. Instead of that kilowatt hour credit, you'll get a 9.2 cent credit on your utility bill for every kilowatt hour that you send out to the grid. Now you pay Rocky Mountain Power somewhere between nine and 14 cents per kilowatt hour that you purchase. 
So the 9.2 cent credit that you get for the kilo hours you export to the grid isn't going to exactly cancel out the energy that you're purchasing from Rocky Mountain Power. It might be higher and it might be lower. It just depends on how you use energy. The important thing is that you'll be guaranteed that rate. So that means you can contact a solar installer and run the numbers for your home and you'll know whether going solar makes sense for you right now. This program is called the Transition Program and it will be available for a few years. We don't know exactly how long. It's capped at 170 megawatts. So that's about 25,000 homes. So there you go. Now you know exactly what to expect going forward. And if you want more information, you can check out our website, utahcleanenergy.org. All right, did that all make sense? How many of you have solar already? Okay, just a, a couple folks in here. So basically, um, as Kate said, this is a good time to invest in solar because the agreement that was proposed or submitted to the Public Service Commission um, would set up three classes, actually. There would be the um, existing uh, net metering customers um, and anyone who applied by November 15th, um, and they would be grandfathered in until December 31st, 2035, um, at the retail credit rate. So in other words, you put a credit, of, uh, you get a credit for every unit uh, or kilowatt hour that you export comes back to you. So that's around 10 cents. One to one. It's one to one, exactly. So what, uh, then what happens is, and uh, the, um, uh, if you sell your property, your, um, um, your agreement, your net metering agreement stays with the property, okay? You can't make any changes though, after November 15th. Uh, so if you wanna add any panels or make any other adjustments, you need to do it before November 15th or you lose your status. The, um, uh, the next group is the transition group, transition solar customers. That begins on November 16th. And it goes on until December 31st, uh, 2032. The, one of the changes there is that um, there will be a new application fee, $60. You'll also be charged a net metering fee for a bi-directional um, uh, meter. Um, so though there are That's some changes there. Charged. Sorry? That is already being charged. No, it's not. No, this is, these, are, these are two new charges. If you, if you enroll after November 16th, you're gonna to have to pay a $60 application fee, and you're gonna to have to pay uh, an as yet to be ter determined um, net I'm metering. I'm already paying an extra fee for the meter. Sorry? I'm already paying for that meter extra. And I got my, I, my application was last year uh -huh. installed. Okay, well. I have to talk to you after, afterwards because I had never heard that before. But in any case, there would be a new fee. And this is in the stipulation agreement that was submitted to the Public Service Commission um, earlier this month. So there would be a couple new charges. Um, and there, as, uh, Jay, as Kate mentioned, there would also be a cap of who can actually enroll in this. Once there is a, a, a 170 megawatts um, aggregate uh, reached for these customers, these transitional customers, they would cap it. It would be in. And anybody who would um, apply after that point, which we don't know when they're going to hit 170, and the, and the power company is supposed to maintain a, uh, a website that tells you how, how close they're getting to it. Anybody who would um, uh, connect after that point would have to, uh, would be compensated at the transitional rate until the Public Service Commission comes up with a new tariff, a new, a new rates schedule. And that's one of the things that happens. Uh, we expect that the Public Service Commission will approve this new agreement um, uh, to take effect November 15th, and that um, that moving forward, the, the people, uh, there, there will be initiated a, um, an export credit proceeding by Rocky Mountain Power immediately, um, which we assume that the Public Service Commission would open up. That would be a new docket to take a look at how much should be the long-term uh, credit for, um, uh, for uh, residential solar. Um, and so that would be an, a new proceeding, but the uh, Public Service Commission could, uh, could change the, the rate structure entirely for this new class of post-transitional customers. So that's, that's a little bit dicey. The other thing is too that the parties are supposed to be working, as you, as you may know that there, there is a, a state solar credit uh, tax incentive. Um, that's due to um, to be eliminated by the end of 2021. And uh, it's, uh, this year is $2,000 uh, that the state will give you in addition to the federal uh, tax credit. Next year it drops to 1,600, 
and the year after it drops another $400 um, unless um, the, the parties can get the Public Service Commission to agree to, to uh, suspend that for two years to give people more time as an incentive to, to take on solar. So basically what happens um, then is a lot of it has to do with the um, uh, export credit uh, proceeding and UCARE is going to be involved with that. We're going to be pitching um, on the, they're going to do a, a new cost benefit an analysis, they're going to do another load research study. We have been pushing for them to include the externalized costs and benefits, um, which they haven't yet done, are not reflected in the current utility rates. So, um, so stay tuned on that one. Um, then some other thing, other points of interest basically in this stipulation agreement would be, uh, apart from the fact that there is no grandfathering for the post-transition customers, um, that there would be a, um, a workshop to determine the nature and scope of the, um, uh, of the export um, proceeding, the export credit pr uh, proceeding, um, that there would be a, um, a pause in the decline of the state tax credit for two years, 2019, 2020, um, that the parties that are involved with this and the power company would establish a communication plan to get the word out to people and also develop a, a Utah.gov website to explain what these different rate structures are going to be meaning uh, for the long term. Um, and then lastly, the, there, there's going to be a, um, uh, a discussion that begins on uh, solar for low-income families. So uh, I think I'll just open it up to any questions at this point, or perhaps, Jason, do we want to transfer to shift over to well, you the know, other presenters? There are questions for Stan. Does anybody have a, a question about some of the, the rate changes or the timelines? Yes. So um, I'm currently building a garage in my backyard. Um, our house wasn't, our roof wasn't ideal, so we were kind of intentionally building, you know, the roof facing the right direction and everything. Um, so that's currently under construction, like, what needs to happen by November 15th? Does it need to be installed, or do we just need to have a permit? No, you have to you have to have an inter interconnection agreement. And, um, and Scott actually will be addressing and, and that. Yes, yeah, Scott will address that. Yeah. Then you have up to 12 months to uh, to get the installation done. Okay. So, yeah. Any other, uh, other questions? How many of you are seriously thinking of, of getting solar? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, all right, very good. And again, I think that if you're going to, now's the time to do it for some other reasons that Scott's going to talk about shortly. Cool. Okay, thank, thank you. Stan. And next we have David Bennett, who came in from Port City. Uh, appreciate him coming down. And you know, one of the challenges that we have in Salt Lake is our air quality. And one of the ideas about having solar is that if you have an electric vehicle, all of a sudden you're turning your electric vehicle into a carbon-free transportation. So that's something that David does, and so could you describe a little bit about that and how you know that works and, and the setup that you've got? Thank you, Jason. First of all, what Stan explained in a nutshell, just kind of keeping things tight, it was a long, contentious process. And the reality is, is that Rocky Mountain Power wanted to decimate rooftop solar. The industry is so large right now that it was able to exert political muscle to the governor back to the regulators, and we were able to, to reach an agreement. The fact that we have an agreement at all, we've kind of lost a little bit. We didn't need any kind of agreement. But if you see what Rocky Mountain Power had proposed, if we were left to the whims of the Public Service Commission and or Mr. Briscoe's legislature, would not have been pretty. I don't own it. I don't own it. I just remember. <laughs> so we ended up with the best that we've got, and as Stan mentioned, and Scott's gonna talk some more about, to be able to get that application in by November 15, really behooves you. It, it, it guarantees, it's, it's really 18 years of the current agreement, which is providing that guarantee that you're gonna be able to pay back the system. So I installed rooftop solar in 2010. Quite frankly, it, didn't pencil out, but it was the right thing to do. It was what I wanted to do. And, and a couple of years ago, as the climate change conversation continues, and I actually saw a, a movie that I just kind of went, I gotta do this. And I, I bought an electric car. So as Jason described, driving my electric car, I don't have any emissions and I don't contribute to air pollution. 
But if you don't link it up with solar, you're simply changing the fossil fuel that you're burning in order to power it. So my solar panels, and, and I installed another array of panels a year ago in order to make sure I have, a, I have enough power to be able to power not just my house, but also my car, allows me to not just not emit any carbon from driving my car, but neither from fueling my car. And so I'm able to make all of the power that I need from the solar panels on my roof and able to power my vehicle. So I'm not burning Rocky Mountain Power's coal in order to drive my car. That's part of the issue just back with Rocky Mountain Power. Still today, the vast majority of the power that they generate comes from coal, not from renewable energy. They're transitioning, but very slowly, very reluctantly. So my encouragement is, as you look at designing your systems, is to keep in mind and to be able to, as you install them, to put in place that charging unit, and it can come directly out of the inverter into the power source that goes to your car so that you can not only help clean up the valley right here, what we experience every day, every, certainly every winter with our bad air, but that you're also not just simply transitioning from, from gasoline to coal, but you're able to operate your system totally with renewable energy. So do you get generate enough electricity for your home and your car October through March? I do because of net metering. I live in Park City and last winter I was out of business for three months. But the other thing about living in Park City, I don't have or need air conditioning. And so during the summer months, I am generating a lot of power. I'm feeding it into the grid. And then I pull that back out in the winter. And I now, with my additional panels, I'm able to be able to do that and take care of all the miles I need to drive for my car. But in Utah, if, if you were somewhere in Utah where you were, had to turn on your conditioning or you were turning on your conditioning, um, my understanding is that if you have excess at the end of one year, you lose it and they start over again. That's a one year calendar year with RMP. In Idaho, with Idaho Power, if you have excess, they cut you a check. But in Utah, if I had excess yeah. power generated from the panels, it's just zeroed out and we start over again. That's my understanding. And your, your understanding is correct. I'm, okay. I'm, after your March power bill, whatever you have left, they yeah. steal. No, it, it, they steal it. They say it goes to low income, but they already have a responsibility to provide additional power for low income. And why do they get the tax break and not mine, not me? But in any event, yes, they go ahead and whatever is left in the bank, they steal at the end of March. And so it behooves you to, to not overbill to understand that. I'm in a little difficult situation because I don't know what the winter's going to be like. And so I very well may be back in a situation where they're taking my power, but that's okay. Uh, I would rather do that than to have to buy additional power from them. You have a monthly bill yes, from I, Rocky Mountain Power. I get a monthly bill from Rocky Mountain Power. I pay $9.12 just as a standard cost of having the meter. and then on that bill it shows how much power I generated, how much power I used. And for these months, it's still through September, I'm generating much more power than what I'm using. I'm putting it in the bank, and then I'm able to pull it out. Part of the contentiousness of, as we've dealt with Rocky Mountain Power is they're saying that the power that we send back in, it's not worth it, it's not worth as much. But... They get the money. When they sell it to somebody else. They get the money. They get the money for it when they sell it, but the other part of it, and there, there's many other parts to this, that as this conversation goes forward and as you, hopefully we've uh, sparked a little bit more interest for you to, to stay tuned and, and follow, the ability to, to provide the power that we generate to our neighbors and not have to send it over the grid, over long distances where the power is lost just because of transmission, there's huge benefits to it. When I'm able to generate a lot of power in the summer and those businesses that have air conditioning nearby are able to use that power, it benefits Rocky Mountain Power, it benefits all of us. So 
net metering really works. I'm saddened that we're in a situation where we've had to negotiate like this. My goal when we entered into these negotiations with the utility was to do what we could to keep Scott's business and the other businesses alive, to keep the industry alive, not do what happened in Nevada. Because five years from now, when we get back in this room and talk about this, it's gonna be a different conversation. We're gonna have the potential battery storage, climate change, unfortunately, is gonna be much more of a reality that won't be able to be ignored, and we're not gonna be behind the eight ball when we, when we sit down with the utility and have this conversation. We did as, as good as we could, we got the best agreement that we can. The industry's alive, I encourage you to listen to Scott and, and consider getting that application in before November 15th and incorporate an automobile into the process that will provide twofold benefits to our overall air quality and generation of power. So you have no storage, am I correct? I, actually, I do have storage. You do have but, storage. I, but the, the type of batteries, today's batteries are from a yesteryear technology. I have storage so that if you have rooftop solar and the grid is disrupted, i.e. if you listen to KUER this morning, to Radio West, if, if and when we have the earthquake. If the grid goes down and you have solar, you're out of business like everybody else, unless you have storage batteries. I have batteries that are designed in case the grid goes down. So I've got about three days worth of power stored up, and if the sun comes out, they'll recharge. So but as long as the sun is out. As long as the sun power. does come out. But but they're not the type of batteries for tomorrow. They're not like our cell phone batteries that we can simply drain every, in, in our instance, we fill them up during the day and use them at night. These batteries you can't do that with. They're not designed for that. They're simply, they're the old lead-based batteries. Tomorrow, and really soon, we're gonna have batteries like in our cell phones. And we'll be able to, that's why I said five years from now, this will be a different conversation. But right now, the, the, the technology's not there, the, the cost benefit's not there, and we're, that's why net metering is so important, is to rely upon the grid and to be able to get in before November 15th and have 18 years is a very wise thing to do. So let me turn it over to Scott and let him tell you a little bit about the industry. Thank you, David. It's great to get that kind of aspirational story as well, because you can make that choice about solar just on the utility of it, but it always helps to have a little bit more to it, like, hey, I'm gonna go completely carbon free with my vehicle. That makes it something even better. So thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. Hi folks, my name's Scott Jones. I'm with Creative Energy Solar. Um, to kind of qualify myself, I'm, I'm credentialed by the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners, specific to photovoltaic solar technical sales. Um, Creative Energies, we're located right here downtown where the guys that built the pink solar trees at the Flamingo exhibit. Um, so we've been doing this for a good long time and I'm here to help answer questions and educate about rooftop solar, what you might want to do now to prepare for it so that uh, you can make it happen and still uh, enjoy the benefits of a really attractive um, rate schedule that's out there. So 99% um, or more of rooftop residential solar systems that you see are simple grid-tied net metered systems. And the actual net meter we've been talking about is um, that bi-directional net meter that allows the economics to make sense for most folks. So. Um, these simple systems don't have storage on site, meaning when the grid goes down, you are grid dependent. The grid fails, you are out of luck, you're not producing, you're, you're just like everybody else, the lights out. Um, with the current net energy metering policy, you're credited one to one. And we kind of need to frame the issue here to get a better understanding of why there's so much pushback and why there's so much resistance from the utility companies. And, and here in East Liberty Park, we're talking about Rocky Mountain Power. Um, so solar is a disruptive technology that's challenging the profits of an antiquated business model, is really what it boils down to. Um, the utility, frankly, their argument is that they don't want this excess energy dumped onto the grid uh, at a time of the day when they, frankly, say that they don't need it. Um, we can counter that argument with multiple studies that have uh, been done across the country that show that net metering is indeed 
a net benefit to everybody, whether you have rooftop solar or whether you don't. Um, like David mentioned, that, that energy that's surplus exported out from your rooftop array if you're at work <coughs> and it's a sunny day stays localized. It stays right there in your neighborhood and probably doesn't leave maybe a five house radius, depending on the size of your system, where it's consumed right there instantly by your neighbors. Um, there is no uh, notable line loss in transmission as that energy goes out and is used by your neighbors. They're none the wiser, but they're using your solar energy. Um, so the utility company doesn't like that, and they're wanting to push back to change how you are compensated for that export, how you interact with the grid. Um, so let's get a, do we have, we have like three different photographs of one after another, yeah? Okay, great. So um, these are a few of the different installations that we've done around town just to, Stop, so you can control. oh, thank you. Um, to illustrate uh, what a simple rooftop system would look like, um, on, on a residential uh, installation. So this is a three and a half kilowatt uh, rooftop array that was put in. You've probably driven past it. It's on Mike South, up by the university. Um, 11 panels, roughly three and a half kilowatt hour, or three and a half kilowatts DC, and that's capable of offsetting probably 60% of the typical homeowner's needs. Um, and that's what that would look like. This is my house. Um, this is a four and a half kW system. And we are all west facing, and we offset about 80 to 85% of our annual needs. And you know, I wish I was at 100%, but I feel really good about that. Um, and then this is a large one with the panels oriented in a slightly different uh, landscape orientation. This is seven and a half kilowatt. So this would more than offset 100% of uh, most people in this uh, part of town's needs. Um, if you're in a larger home, this would this would probably generate around uh, 9,500 kilowatt hours or so. Um, so again, most most people here in the neighborhood use maybe 8,000 or so kilowatt hours. So this would be a little bit oversized. So those are kind of three uh, illustrations of what solar looks like on some of the houses in the area. How many panels? Uh, so we can see it. This is 11. Mm -hmm. What's the next one? Uh, this one is 15. Okay. Yep. And the next one? I think this one was 30, 30 something. I'd have to count them up again. Um, but kind of an important um, thing to note is a panel isn't a panel. There's so many different brands and manufacturers and wattage ratings that uh, if you're interested in doing solar, you really do want to do your due diligence and work with a reputable contractor that's been doing this for a while, uh, somebody that probably doesn't knock on doors. Um, so you do want to do due diligence. Um, there's some really neat technologies that are being driven and kind of their hands being forced to innovate for what we call self-consumption and storage on site. Um, so batteries are now entering the mix and are going to have to, like, like David mentioned, uh, five years from now the conversation if you're interested in solar isn't just going to be putting panels up on the roof. It's going to be smart grid management and having uh, storage in a battery on site. Um, so there's some neat, neat technologies out there that allow that. Uh, you've probably all heard the hype from uh, Tesla Solar City, where they've got this power wall battery that's starting to come online. Um, it's still very limited and not widely distributed, so it's going to be awfully hard to find one of those and to, and to pin down pricing. Um, I can say right now, uh, there's a really elegant design that's out there by LG Chem. Um, you can put on a 10 and a half kilo, or a 10 kilowatt hour battery system that's paired with your inverter and it's very uh, very tidy, very elegant. Uh, you can add two of these batteries on and the cost is really quite affordable compared to what it used to be. Um, so some of the, so what this, this battery and this system allows you to do is minimize how you're interacting with the grid. So rather than exporting that surplus of energy out to the grid that your neighbors are using, you're now storing it in your garage or wherever your battery bank is. When the sun goes down at night, you're then depleting that battery, draining it down. You can program this thing if, if the utility companies, the powers that be ever get really draconian and start doing some time of use uh, rate structures, which it's coming, it will happen, and it'll probably happen up in about three years. Um, it won't any longer be a tiered rate structure where it's just counting how many kilowatt hours you consume. It's also gonna be, you're gonna be built on when you consume that energy. 
and energy that you consume between typically 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. when folks are coming home from work, turning on the microwave, turning on their air conditioning, uh, cooking dinner, doing loads of laundry, that is gonna be the most expensive energy. So you can program these things uh, to avoid purchasing energy at those times. You can even fill the battery bank up at 2 a.m. from the grid to buy cheap energy and then avoid some of these high, high use uh, rate structures. So there's some really exciting neat things coming out. Um, and we can help with some of that. Uh, but LG Chem makes a good one. Um, and that's really the future of uh, the, the, the solar model for a residential going forward, I think, after, after the rate changes happen. Um, so the grandfathering period, uh, November 15th is the deadline to submit a net metering application. It is not a commenced construction date. It is not a, a completion date. It simply means the application needs to be submitted. You then have 12 months to get it in, um, and then you'll be grandfathered out through the end of 2035. So that's good news. Um, we talked about the transitional rate structure. The value of that energy drops about, you lose about 10% maybe 15% if you're an energy hog, um, of the value of solar if you were to beat that deadline, if you're a transitional customer. So it's not the end of the world, but it's not great. Um, thereafter, it'll probably be that time of use rate structure, and we'll see what Rocky Mountain Power, uh, what scheme they come up with there. Um, I think we talked about tax credits. Utah does still have a $2,000 tax credit for this year. Next year it drops to $1,600. It was originally phased to continue a decline and then phase out. Part of this settlement agreement with the key stakeholders and net metering um, is that they're gonna hold that $1,600 credit, hopefully for the next three years. Uh, so that, that's a big win. Um, is that fiscal year or calendar year? Calendar year, yep. yep. So it's the year the system <laughs> was installed and operational. I mean they dropped the 1600 Yes. Yep. If the system is installed and operational on or after January 1 of 2018, when you file 2018's taxes, the max credit you're going to see is 1600 bucks. What is the federal credit? The federal is currently uncapped, and it's a 30% uh, credit, tax credit on all eligible system costs. So if you have to upgrade your main electrical service to accommodate solar, that's included. And upgrading the roof would fit into that. Not necessarily. <laughs> Talk to your tax advisor. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're reticent to give out tax advice, but there is some real sticky, sticky stuff going on there, and there's some uh, tax fraud schemes that some guys are, are doing or participating in. So I would tread very lightly there. Um, yeah. And the federal tax credit's on its way out by 2022. Yep, the federal tax credit is uh, beginning a phase out, a step down and phase out. It's uh, on the books, it is to remain static at 30% uncapped through 2019. So if you install a system through 2019, you get 30% back as a federal tax credit. Um, that is currently under threat by the administration, the Trump administration, and there's some rumor of potentially repealing that. However, there were some negotiations, uh, I don't know if we want to go down this rabbit hole, but there were, there were some give and take to allow them to uh, extend the federal investment tax credit back in the end of 2015, but if they rescind that, it would be really, really bad policy. So hopefully um, it'll remain unchanged through 2019, and then it drops to 24%, I believe 20%, and then it goes away in 2021 altogether for residential. Yeah? What's the 2000 based on? A percentage of? It's, it's just a, it's an arbitrary number that the state came up with. It's 25% of the total system cost with a cap of $2,000. 25%. Yeah. If you put seven or eight panels on your roof, you probably hit that point of diminishing return. Yeah. Uh, right after I just presented, it was saying about electric cars. Um, I just, does anyone know, when I bought my lease, I got 1,500 uh, state. I believe, it, I believe the, uh, the car credit goes away at the end of this year.
Yeah. There's some word of caution there, though. Like, if we if we look at why, why would a utility company be incentivizing you to, I mean, there's some hidden agenda here. <laughs> Believe it or not. Um, just, so, they just do just enough to, to, right. so that someone will tap it on the head and they say, see, we're being a good boy. So if you're charging an electric vehicle with a level two charger, sure. depending on the ampacity rating of your charger, if it's a 30 amp plug, you're pulling over 6,000 watts at any moment when that thing's fueling up. If Rocky Mountain Power implements a demand charge, a time of use or a demand charge, without purchasing energy, but just paying for the right to purchase that energy, you could get whopped with perhaps a 50 plus dollar bill just for the right to purchase that energy under what they proposed with this really uh, draconian rate structure. You said you didn't think that would happen for three years. Yeah. But and then what if you set your charger to, I mean, by then someone's got to come up with some sort of little chip which will tell you when to turn that charger on. Sure. Are you saying it would be a fee? Just the ability to plug your electric in? That is what a demand charge is. Because if that... No matter what time it is. They're just trying to shape the problem as they're trying to shift their risk. Yep. And we all use a one, it, it's, they got to build capacity mm -hmm. so that they have enough at that particular time of day on July or August where everyone turns on their air conditioners right. and everything is maxed. And so right. in the past, they've overloaded their system right. with natural gas and coal mm -hmm. because those are easy to run. Yep. When you do distributive energy, it's more difficult. Correct. You got to yep. do a little bit of thinking. Yes. But they still have a problem. We have to recognize that they have this problem because it's our problem because we live in the system. Yep. That's where storage is going to play a key element, whether it's rooftop or if it's a neighborhood storage device or whatever, but it's all shifting that way away from yeah, the city. And the governor, uh, governor Sandoval blew it. <coughs> Maybe we can resurrect in the legislature this year to go to veto. Yeah. To give people renewable energy credits for bringing the storage on and doubling the credits that they have. If that energy comes online during that period, that we have nine. Yeah. Is that right? Um, I think, Stan, you mentioned that if you add extra panels after November 15th, it negates your agreement. Is that correct? You lose your status. You lose, you lose your, your status. Grant Not for the new panels, but for the whole shebang. Yep. No. Yeah. So, so for example, let's say that you want to add, I'll, I'll give you our example. We have 14 panels, and we're going to uh, add six um, because we've got to leave as well. And so that, that's increased our, our demand. And we're going to have it done. We're Sign off before November 15th. Well, it has to be built, but you have to have an agreement. So. Right, right. The interconnection agreement has to be signed before November 15th. Otherwise, we would lose our status and start from scratch. Start you over. Know, we you start almost want to go basically the transition. You know, whole hog in before November 15th because otherwise you would lose it. And I'm wondering, would that negation also happen if you changed your battery storage, or is it only for the reducing aspect? The, the, the. Step, the stipulation of the settlement agreement reads that any material modification that adds generating capacity to your system makes you no longer a net energy metering customer and then subject to whatever. So basically it means more panels on the roof. The storage. You could add a battery. battery. That's how I interpret it. Okay. That's, yeah, that's okay. my interpretation. It's probably the wise move because technology is changing very quickly. Right. Right. And I'll be around, I'll be around. I don't want to, I know we're getting late in to well, the evening. We got a question back here. So, Need the permit yet? You won't be able to. You won't be able to actually interconnect the system because it won't pass. Uh, you won't. You won't be issued a building permit to install the system unless we also have an engineering report that states that the roof is uh, engineered appropriately to safely and adequately support the weight of the solar system. So, you, you know, we would identify that prior to the install. But let's say you have a, a poor roof. Could you sign an interconnect agreement before November 15th and not have the roof prepared before November? 15th? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yep. You just need to make a commitment and tell Rocky Mountain Power essentially, here's the system I'm putting up, and then as long as you get it put up within 12 months, you're golden. Yeah. 
You can download it from uh, Rocky Mountain Power. It's actually now done on an automated website called Power Clerk. And you will have to go through the kind of egregious process of creating a username, password, and you'll have to call somebody and be able to set that up. Or anybody you buy solar from, they have. Yes. They do that for you. Yeah. What's the website again? Power Clerk. Power Clerk. C L E R K. Yeah. Can you go to second part? Yeah. So, so the site, the quality of the site really dictates our approach. You know, every, that's the thing, is every single solar installation is a one-off. And it should be customized specific to your shade conditions, your orientation, your pitch. Um, there's guys out there that are selling solar based off of a spreadsheet saying, here's the optimal conditions, this is what you're going to get. And if you believe that and you put it up, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Um, so. You know, if, if you've got a good viable roof, free of shade, you can go with cheaper components and you can do it, you know, around $3 a watt is a, is a really competitive price. Um, if you're looking at premium components, you're upwards of, could be $4 a watt. And there's guys that are gouging folks that are way above that. But the, the average system that we saw um, when, we, when we did the University of Utah's community solar program was about a six KW system. And that, that system would cost about 18,000 bucks on average. It could be lower, it could be slightly higher, depending on what your roof looks like and, and how efficient it is. Um, you pull out two grand for the tax credits and 30% off, and now that system is maybe 10 and a half, $11,000. So the, the ITC, the federal and the state discount, make a huge deal, make a big difference on making it viable or, or affordable for most folks. So uh, I used to work at the U, mm -hmm. and I think I already filled out one of these applications. Okay. Would that be, uh, but I don't know where it went. Sure. I submitted it, but I don't know. Yeah. We could call Rocky Mountain Power. I can give you my card. We can call and find out. Uh, most likely, if it's been close to a year, you'll want to submit a new one through Power Clerk. Just to, they use basically the Dewey Decimal System filing cabinet, and then they upgraded to this new automated website. Um, so we we want to up to up you know do a new a new application or interconnection agreement. That's pretty easy though. And I'll be around to field more questions, but I want to respect everybody's time. One more, one more okay. Time. Yeah. Um, I heard talk because uh, um, in this uh, new community solar one um, but community solar rain programs that are going on that we also uh, yeah, so there's a, we're actually partnered with the Sierra Club, so I could, I could talk to you about that if you remember the Sierra Club. Um, I, I had a door hanger that talked about Sugar House Community Solar Program, and that's just a fabricated tactic. There's, there's no true community solar programs that I know of right now. All right, well, I want to thank our guests, uh, Scott. David and Stan for coming by and talking to us. They'll be around a little bit longer. Um, but actually, before you head out, there's one more incentive, right? And that is to have to see a tariff on foreign solar cells. Is there right? is. Yes. Yeah. So um, there were two domestic manufacturers, Ceneva and Solar World, and they're actually both foreign owned. Um, <laughs> go figure. Uh, that, that both went insolvent. Uh, solar World went insolvent uh, out of Germany, which is the equivalent of the U.S. market of bankruptcy. And then Ceneva, who manufactures out of Georgia and Michigan, uh, just filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Um, those two guys got together and then filed a trade uh, tariff petition. Uh, the International um, Trade Commission found injury. They just ruled on it last week. They said, yes, this practice of cheap uh, components, panels, coming from the Pacific Rim being dumped on the US market caused uh, injury to these companies and perhaps led to their demise. There's speculation on whether or not it was poor management or really there was something behind it. Um, but it's going now to the to the White House uh, to find out how they're going to, what kind of a tariff they're going to impose on all solar modules, solar panels that are not grown, fabricated, uh, assembled, 
and uh, completed in the United States, which means every solar panel out there. It also applies to computer chips. Uh, any silica that's imported. Um, the recommendation is that they impose a 40 cent per watt tariff, which essentially um, adds a minimum of 50% increase to the cost of a solar panel if this goes through, and perhaps doubles it. So we're, the industry is getting hit from just about every angle you can imagine right now. So it's a bit, it's a big overcorrection, but uh, we'll know more. Um, I believe they, it goes to the, to the White House on the 2nd of October, and then they've got 60 days to, to make a ruling. They might make a ruling immediately, and they might milk it out and wait until you know, early January. Um, but yeah, there is the potential for the cost of the components, the key component in the system to increase quite dramatic, dramatically. So timing's really good now. Um, and that's really the, the message here in a nutshell. The, 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 the Thanks for coming out.